right, uh, we left off in Joshua chapter 23 last time, and uh, hopefully we'll finish the book of Joshua today, and next week, Lord willing, we will begin the book of Judges, and we'll look at some of the things that that book has to teach us. In Joshua chapter 23 and 24, we have Joshua's final farewell speech to the people, uh, the elders of Israel, and so on. And uh, just as the book of Deuteronomy was a big farewell speech from Moses to exhorting the people to stay faithful, uh, Joshua 23 and 24 is a similar exhortation. Uh, so we'll start reading verses 1 through 16 of chapter 23. Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side. And Joshua was old and advanced in years that Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. But the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. See, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes, with all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan, even to the great sea, toward the setting of the sun. The Lord your God, He will thrust them out before you and drive them from before you, and you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right or hand or to the left so that you will not associate with these nations these which remain among you or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out the great and the strong nations from before you. And as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to flight a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you, and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you. But there will be a snare and a trap to you, a whip on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you, not one of them has failed. And it shall come about that just as all the good works were words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you. So the Lord will bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you from off his good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God and he commanded you, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. Alright, so here, you know, he calls all the people together. Uh, once again, we have a mention of the fact that God gave them rest. We talked about that in a previous class. And here in verses 3 through 5, Joshua begins talking about uh, the, the uh, God's giving of the land and Israel's taking of the land. And what does he have to say about that, the, re the relationship between those two things? It was promised, okay. You've seen all the Lord... What, 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 what do we see in these verses, though? Don? Well, well for the sake, be very firm then, keep the two all that is written in the book of all the Moses, you may not find the Bible to the right hand or left, so that you don't associate with the nations, now that you have served them and their gods, because you are the same to the Lord your God that you have done this day. For the Lord your God has driven out of you, and you have done does that charge remind us of anything that we've seen earlier? Hmm? Constantly. Constantly. We've seen it constantly. Uh, one particular place we might remember is at the beginning of the book of Joshua, whenever he told Joshua to be sure to keep all that is in the book of the law of Moses. Be careful to do all that God has instructed you. Okay? Um, he also basically tells him They don't follow what God says to do. Okay. Mark? Seems that these verses, 
we could we could phrase them another way, and of course I'm very loosely paraphrasing here, but in essence, God promised them, made a promise to them, and insofar as they showed their willingness for God to keep his promise, God kept his promise. In other words, I promise to do this, you have to do this. Now, insofar as they did their part, God did his part. But God only went as far as the people let him go by their obedience to him or lack thereof. Yes, and uh, that, 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 oh, Keith, you have something. Huh? I would just want to add that the burden of the message is the fact that God fought their battles. Yes. God fought their battles. Those nations were much more powerful than they were. God gave them the victory. He wanted to remind them, you're where you are because God fought the battles. Yeah. Yes, and Don. Well, there's one other thing. God's faithful people that are theoretically are supposed to be serving Him or claim to be serving Him. Uh, God kept His promise regarding the land and the people and keep their promise to Him. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we read it, uh, I think it's in Nehemiah 9. Yeah, that, that, that's I think and all those comments together kind of you know are right on that you know the big contrast between God's faithfulness to his promises and God's always faithful to his promises. And the people's sort of you know sometimes they're faithful, sometimes they're not. And here, here's the big, I mean, you see again this big tension. On the one hand, in verse 3, God fought Israel's battles. He's given them the land. It is a free gift in every sense that we could talk about it. But in verse 4, he says, See, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribe. Israel still has work left to do. They still have more land to take from the nations. This is the same tension that we've seen throughout the book of Joshua. That even though the land is a free gift, Israel still has to take said gift or they're not going to get it. Uh, this is the, the real issue. And, you know, Israel's success in taking that gift is related to their faithfulness. God is faithful to His promises. The question is, will Israel remain faithful to God? God has given them the land. The Lord your God has thrust them out before you and draw... and. No, the Lord your God, He will thrust them out before you and drive them out before you and you will possess their land. You know, God's going to drive them out, but you have to possess the land. And they actually have to do what He says on that point. Uh, now there's a warning throughout here too. What does He warn them against? He's not going to drive them out if they don't remain faithful. If they don't remain faithful, yeah. You know, look at verse 10 in particular. One of you puts to flight a thousand. You know, that's an echo of something in the covenant curses. Uh, in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 32, it talks about how Israel was put to flight by just a couple of you know, men. There are th one man puts a thousand to flight as part of the curses of the covenant. Here, Israel is doing that in the nations. There's kind of an implied idea here that if Israel doesn't cling to the Lord their God, if they don't hold fast to Him, then the Lord will no longer, well, then the Lord's going to reverse those fortunes and they will be put to flight as a nation by the side of one man. Don, did you have something? I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a. point out verse 11 as well. yes, verse 11 take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. You know, again, echo of stuff that we see in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4 in verse 5. Deuteronomy 6 in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Um, now, uh, one other thing. Uh, we talked about putting Canaanites to flight. In verses 12 and 13, what does Joshua seem... You know, what, what is his main concern there? Intermarriage. Uh, it's interesting the term he uses here in verse 12. If you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, the Lord your God will not drive them out before you. He will make them a snare to you, a whip on your sides, thorns in your eyes until you perish from the land which the Lord has given you. Uh, now that word for cling in verse 12, it's the same word that's used in Genesis 2. A man shall leave father and mother and cling to his wife, or cleave to his wife, or depending on the version you're reading, and the two shall become one flesh. In verse 8, 
that word is used to say you are to cling to the Lord your God. There's a sense in which the people are supposed to cleave to Him because they are married to Him in a sense. Uh, you know, Jeremiah 13 talks, describes the people as kind of a linen waistband that clings to the waist of the Lord. But, you know, in result, you know, he says if you, if you cling to the nations instead of the Lord, then this relationship's not going to continue. It's going to be destruction instead. And the Lord will no longer help you fight these nations. The Lord will no longer, maybe since you love them so much, and you, know, and you love them so much, the Lord's not going to fight them for you anymore. Instead, He's going to give you pretty much what you ask for. You're going to get these nations. And what will happen is they won't be a very helpful spouse now, will they? They're going to be thorns in your sides, well, thorns in your eyes, whips on your sides. Uh, the same term kind of thinking is, appears in Judges chapter 2 in verse 3. Whenever the, Israel fails to drive out the nations, the Lord says, Therefore I have also said I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. All of those uh, things that God warned them against in Joshua 23 come to pass in Judges chapter 2. Uh, and verse 15 continues driving the point home about God's faithfulness. But what do we learn in verse 15 about God's faithfulness to His promises? His faithfulness is absolute. He, he doesn't ever uh, relent. But uh, promises that are conditional are conditional upon what the people do about them. All right. There's something else. What, Don, do you have something? Well, it's... Uh, Seems like it's a very fearful language for these guys to be listening to. That it shall come about that just as all the good works which the Lord your God spoke to you will come upon you, so the Lord, on the other hand, will bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Mm -hmm. uh, God is faithful to his promises. He's also faithful to the threats he makes. He doesn't make those lightly either. You know, God keeps his promises, but that includes his promises to punish them if they, you know, do something bad. And so, you know, God is faithful in all respects. He doesn't make promises lightly, and he doesn't make threats lightly. You know, he is a God of absolute truth. And so, you know, if God is going to be faithful and truthful, then he has to make good on his threats. You know, we, we, we say God keeps his promises. You know, that doesn't just mean that we're going to have happiness and rainbows everywhere we go. Uh, you know, sometimes those promises can be promises of destruction if we're not careful, if we are unfaithful to Him. And one example of that is when God finally took Judah out of the way. He said it, is for the, it was for the sins of Manasseh and the innocent blood which he shed, which God could not forgive. Now Manasseh was a wicked king for ten years. The next, was it thirty years? Didn't he reign forty years total? <laughs> Uh, 52, I think. Okay, well, for the next 40 some years of his reign, he was taken into captivity, he repented, and he was a good king the rest of his reign. But that first part of his reign was what sealed Judah's faith. Now, later on, Josiah came, and God stayed the destruction of Judah for a little while because of Josiah, but eventually the destruction was going to come because yeah. God had, uh, had made a promise during the massive bloodletting. You know, well, I mean, there's an implication in Scripture that, you know, most prophecies are conditional in that respect, even if the conditions are not stated. You know, I mean, Jonah, he walks through Nineveh, he says, 40 days and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. He doesn't qualify that. He doesn't state a condition. He doesn't say, unless you guys repent. And yet, the people repent and God doesn't overthrow Nineveh. Which, you know, the condition does not have to be stated for it to be implicit. Uh, that's just the way God operates. But um, nevertheless, you know, I mean, if Israel is faithful to God, you know, I mean, I like, I like to remain, maintain the optimistic possibility that if Israel had had a succession of kings that had all repented, they would have been able to escape destruction. But that wasn't what happened. And you know, God, being the all-knowing God that He is, seeing into the hearts of people as He does, could probably, you know, have told you up front, you know, there isn't going to be, or they're not getting out of this situation. They're, they're they have gone too far into their depraved actions and they have made a whole mess of themselves. Um, you know, but that's what we have uh, in this context. And in verse 16, you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which He commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. The anger of the Lord will burn against you and you will perish quickly from the good land which He has given you. You know, I mean, is God just and right in doing that? Well, yeah, He is. He gave them the land 
and he maintains the right to take the land away. It is ultimately his land, and they are merely his tenants. He has the right as landlord to evict his people anytime he wants if they do not abide by the terms of the lease. Uh, to make an analogy there. Yes, Don? Also, consider all the good things that he did for them. Mm -hmm. And they should have been considered talks about you know, the danger of forgetting God and prosperity. Uh, you know, he led you through the great wilderness. He fed you in the wilderness. And you know, he might humble you and test you. Verse 17, otherwise you might say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. And I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord God made to perish before you, so you shall perish because you do not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 through 20. You know, it's important to remember God and prosperity. It's easy to forget you know, when we have wealth and to give ourselves credit for what we have. You know, well, well, it was my work ethic that got me this far. Well, it was the Lord that gave you that work ethic. So, I mean, at the end of the, the Lord gave you the might to accomplish this, those thing, those great things. And ultimately, there's not a gift in the world that you have that you cannot attribute to God Himself. And that's the thing we have to remember and keep in mind. Any comments or questions, Tom? Yes. Uh, I have a question. I, I've been wondering since we've been studying this. Does the God mean that they're not going to associate with these other people at all? I know He means don't. There is a. a distinction in Deuteronomy 20 between the nations that they were supposed to utterly destroy, the Canaanites, and the surrounding nations, which they were to offer them terms of peace and you know, kind of integrate them into their, you know, their larger structure, make vassals out of them, in which case they would be spared. Uh, now, the Bible does have other things to say about that, especially when you get to the New Testament, and that principle you're talking about is almost certainly... A, Espoused in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for instance. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul talks about how to deal with those who are immoral among the congregation. He says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, does that mean everybody? Well, no, Paul goes on to qualify it in verse 10. He says, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. Now, that's impossible. You're not going to do that. But, verse 11, actually I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Now, there's a difference. You know, on the one hand, if we see a worldly person being worldly, well, there's a teaching opportunity. There's a way for us to, you know, an avenue for us to talk to them and things like that. If we see a brother in Christ doing that, oh, well, that requires a little different response. And, you know, the level of maturity, I think, requires a little different response, too. Jude talks about that. You know, having mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Um, 
You know, the idea there, again, is that if we have somebody who should know better, and they're still choosing to walk in such a way that you know, is contrary to the will of God, you know, at that point we dissociate ourselves from those people. You know, those who are outside God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourself. That, that's 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9-13. Mark. I think there's, there's another thing that Tom mentioned, maybe, that I don't, what I don't see in the Old Testament teaching is a command to go ye into all the world and teach mm -hmm. the law of Moses. The Israelites were to separate themselves from the other nations of the world, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. And they weren't really, they weren't given the command to go teach the law to other nations. They were to be separate from the other nations under the Old Covenant. Uh, or the covenant of Moses, I should say. There were a couple of old covenants. There was one with Abraham right. and Moses probably, but uh, they, they were they were to evangelize the world like we're told to today. So there's a little bit of a difference in the attitude of God toward the other nations. Now the other nations did have patriarchs that could access God. They had access to God if they wanted it, but not through the law of Moses and through the high priest and through the sacerdotal Israelite priesthood. Well, one thing we need to keep in mind in all of this is that, uh, you know, Israel is a teaching tool to the nations, but not in the way that we would think about it. I mean, um, and I, I don't want to get too far off track on this idea, but uh, well, one thing we have is uh, that whenever the curses came upon Israel, they would become exemplary model to the rest of the nations around them. Look at what God did to Israel. Well, why, why are they in ruins? Why are they in shambles? Because they defied the Lord their God. Um, you know, in the same way, you know, if Israel is, of course, acts rightly and goodly, then, you know, the rest of the nations will see that well, the Lord is with them, He's protecting them, and He's defending them. And so, you know, their faithfulness gives occasion, and it becomes sort of a litmus test for, you know, look at, look at what God's doing to them, look at what God has not done for them, is showing us how they're faithful to that covenant God. And so there is kind of a, a teaching of the nations going on. Um, now, you know, ultimately, God does have a plan to restore all nations. There's a restoration of all things that takes place. But Israel is sort of a tool that he uses to bring that kind of thing about. Um, Keith, did you have something? I think I saw your hand. Yeah, um, I would pose this question. Would we go, you know, for the big on gambling? Would we go to the dog track and try to convert people? Would we go and to highlight for our time to try would we go inside of a bar <laughs> and try and convert people? I mean, people that advocate that kind of thing, but I don't know about that. I don't think... Well, that's why, that's why, not. Why, not. why not? Why not? Well, it, 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 there, why, 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 why are you there? I mean, there, there is no intent on the part of those patrons to yeah. what we have to say. That's perhaps what's going on here. There is no intent to hear what Israel has to say. And only God can know that. Right. And now, if he ordered the destruction of the nations, it's his prerogative because the land is his anyway. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's, he's a landlord. He can, he can throw out one tenant and put in the, when he gets ready. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that you know, we've seen Rahab, you know, convert, become part of Israel, and the Lord appears to have accepted that. We see later on Ruth, she becomes part of the lineage of Christ. She was a Moabite woman, you know, normally banned from the assemblies of Israel. And so there is, people do maintain the option of sort of proselytizing, if you will. And the Lord has certainly brought, you know, outsiders to himself. Um, but, you know, and ultimately I think Jesus uses Old Testament examples like that, you know, like Naam and the Syrian or the widow of Zarephath to show how God has always been showing grace to the Gentiles and how it is ultimately part of his plan to bring them as the other sheep not of this fold into the one flock with one shepherd. Uh, that, that is the, the idea that is being brought forth. Yes? He also knew uh, before the flood that the world had become so corrupt that it was irreversible. Yes, that, that's true. There's, there's... He decided to destroy the world. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's a, there's a lot of times in Israel's history where they reach. Well, there's a lot of times in human history where a nation reaches the point of no return, and you know the Lord, you know, brings about destruction in that way. Okay, chapter 24. I would like to get into chapter 24. Uh, <laughs> 
Oh. I just wanted to ask you a question about the Nineveh and Jonah. Oh, yeah. Or the fact that uh, Jewish people. In Nineveh? Yeah. No, Nineveh, the Ninevites were Assyrians. Yeah, Noah was preaching to the Gentiles. Well, there's an instance where there's an instance of preaching to Gentiles in the Old Testament. Uh, well, it's a rare instance, uh, but yeah, I don't know why I mentioned it earlier and didn't think of it. But yeah. Joshua 24. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt by what I did in their, its midst and after what I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. And they fought with you and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of the land when I destroyed them before you. Then Barak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Gergeshite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. And then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Right. That brings us down to verse 13. You know, he recounts a series of significant events in Israel's history. The patriarchs. You know, interesting. What, what, does he, what does he mention here about the patriarchs? It's, I, well, among other things. This is one of the rare instances in the Old Testament where we learn that Abraham's family worshipped idols when they were living outside of the land of Canaan. Now, that's an interesting point here. Now, one of the few passages in the Bible that talks about this. Abraham did not come from a righteous background. God's call of Abraham was based on mercy from the beginning. You know, Israel's origin was pagan by nature. God chose them not because they were the greatest of the nations, not because they were the strongest of the nations, but because what? Hmm? And when he chose to demonstrate his power through the foolish things, to make foolish the wisdom of the world. And 1 Corinthians 1 talks about that. Deuteronomy 7 and 9, which I am so fond of quoting, you know, the Lord did not choose you because you were more in number. The Lord did not choose you because you were more righteous than any of the nations. You are stiff-necked people. You are a weak people. But the Lord chose you because he loved you. And chose to demonstrate his glory through you. Hmm. And so... You know, what we see is God removes Abraham from that idolatrous family in verse 3 to worship God alone. And he multiplies his descendants. Uh, we see that Esau inherited Mount Seir, but Jacob went down to Egypt. This, uh, he recounts the Exodus in verses 5 through 7. He recounts their victories east of the Jordan in verses 8 through 10. And the attempts of Balaam to try to curse Israel. Well, that doesn't work out too well. Uh, he recounts the conquest itself in verses 11 through 12, which we spent the last several months studying in the book of Joshua. God gave Israel victory at almost every turn as they were faithful to Him, so He was faithful to His promises. But Israel's gift of the land was ultimately an act of grace. It was a land they did not work for. It was a land they did not labor over. They were living in cities they did not build, and they are eating off of vineyards and olive groves that they did not plant. And, but Joshua's allusion to Deuteronomy 6 here indicates where he's going with this. In Deuteronomy 6, in verses 10 through 12, it says, It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, great and splendid cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself, but you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship Him and swear by His name. So Joshua recounts all those things, and he says, you're living in this land, you've got all this stuff that you didn't work for, 
Therefore, verse 14, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served which were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What does it mean to serve the Lord in sincerity and truth? God. The same way we have to go today in sincerity and truth, obedience to His will. Yeah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Yeah. You know, you don't just worship Him to keep up appearances. You worship Him because you actually love Him. Because you actually want to be a part of Him. Absolute loyalty. Internal and external devotion. You know, I think Jesus actually kind of alludes to this passage in John 4, but He changes something. You know, He, he says, you know, worship in spirit and truth. And people frequently interpret spirit and truth to mean sincerity and truth. But Jesus describes that as something that is, well, new and different. Why? Is it because God all of a sudden demands sincerity from His people in the new age? No. God's always wanted His people to be sincere. No, but Jesus talks about a profound change in the character of worship. You know, that, you know it's no longer based on geographical location. It's no longer based on the, the restricted to a single sanctuary in a single location. Rather, it is in spirit and truth. And that the true worshipers, not contrasted with... You know, it's not like the worship before it was false. But it was just a model. It was just a shadow. It was just a type of what was to come. Uh, and Israel is offered a choice in verse 15. And what is that choice? Well, if able to serve God, then make your choice. Uh -huh. yeah. which, which God are you going to serve? You can serve these gods. You can serve, you can serve the Babylonian gods. You can serve Egyptian gods. Or you can serve Yahweh. Essentially, he's telling them to make, make a choice. Don't sit on the fence. You could say here, and, and he says, as for me and my house, we're going to choose to serve God. There's really only one choice that people really make, and that's in, and everything else in life is kind of a playing out of that. Are you going to serve God or not? That's the basic choice people make. You know, Deuteronomy 30 talks about how, um, you know, see, I have, Deuteronomy 30 in verses 19 through 20, it's the same, when Joshua is reiterating the same idea here, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him. For this is your life, and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. Keith, did you have something? Or? Well, uh, worship is uh, to serve. Yeah. So, so we demonstrate our sincerity through what we do, what we say, mm -hmm. um, our deeds. Uh, if they are deeds that uh, reflect the character of God, um, all of that is sincerity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something else just occurred to me here. Uh, Moses, uh, you know, Baal wasn't a jealous God. Baal didn't care if you served Ashtaroth mm -hmm. and if you served Molech and if you served Jehovah. You know, you could serve them. You can still serve me. I don't care. As long as you, you know, throw a pinch of incense on my altar, you can throw a pinch of incense on everybody else's altar. Right. But Moses told them that God is a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me was one of his initial commandments to them. You can't serve these other gods and serve me. And here Joshua is, is at least alluding to that command of Moses when he says, you got to make a choice. You can't sit on the fence here and serve all these gods. And their answer to me, the people answered him and said, far be it from us that we should forsake Jehovah to serve other gods. Makes me wonder here a little bit, were, were they not totally getting the point here? Because they said, we won't forsake Jehovah and serve other gods, but yet they served the other gods and tried to serve Jehovah too. Right. Down the line. Yeah, well, and we're about to get to that. Yeah, there, there's a problem here, definitely, with the people's responses. You know, because throughout this chapter, the people are going to repeatedly affirm that we will serve God, sure. Verse 16, people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And who did these
these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way which we went and among all the peoples throughout whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for He is, on our, for he is our God. You know, so we, that sounds good on the surface, doesn't it? We will serve the Lord. You know, um, they probably took Joshua's words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, cross-stitched him and hung him up in their kitchen or something like that, you know? A lot of us do that. But it doesn't mean anything if you don't actually do what it says. And, you know, you know what Joshua says next. He's actually very pessimistic about the people's ability to follow through on this. Joshua said to the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He's done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve Him. They said, We are witnesses. Well, now therefore put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God. We will obey His voice. And Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. But Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which He spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you so that you do not deny your God. And Joshua dismissed the people each to his inheritance. God. I find it interesting in verse 23 there. Now you guys are, you got, who are you guys going to serve? Them? We're going to serve the Lord. Now you guys aren't going to be able to, well, yeah, we are. Okay, well then, put away the idols that are amongst you and yep. serve the Lord. Oh, but we will serve the Lord. Yeah. Put away those idols. Why are those idols there in the first place? Right. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, you know, if people are really going to serve Yahweh, Put those things away that are serving you. Yeah, I know. Well, what are the idols even doing there? If you were really intending to follow through with this, the idols would already be gone. They wouldn't be there in the first place. You know, so First Corinthians 8, we know that they're nothing. Oh, of course. We're strong. Yes, well, that's a, that, that was a Corinthian slogan that was used to justify going and eating in idol temples. And, you know, I'm, I'm against the popular view. I don't think Paul was approving of eating meat sacrificed to idols. I think he was, you know, he gets, in a roundabout way, he condemns it. Um, you know, the, ang the language here, uh, you know, reco recalls the image in Genesis 35 where Jacob buries the family idols. You know, but, you know, okay guys, let's clean out the tents and get these idols and bury them under the tree. But you know, one thing that's never mentioned in this chapter is it's never mentioned that they actually got rid of the idols. Uh, you know, verse 26, Joshua writes all this stuff in the book of the law, which indicates the book of the law doesn't stop at Deuteronomy. It apparently included some things in Joshua as well. Um, and, you know, it's open apparently open for further writing even after Moses. The conspicuously absent is any ap m mention of the idol's removal. It seems to remain among the people. This is a very ominous story. You know, Joshua is not optimistic about the people's ability to serve. He tells them they cannot serve the Lord. You will not be able to serve the Lord. And what do we know about Israel's history? Do they do what they say here? They forsake the Lord at every turn in the book of Judges. We're going to see that as we get into the next section of the book, or into the next book. You know, I'm not saying that ver you know, the verbal confession is right and good, sure, certainly. But it's not enough. It's not sufficient. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Jesus talks about that, you know. Yes? Saying and doing are two different oh. things, right? <laughs> I was just going to say, Shechem is these. Same place that in Genesis 12, God talks to Abram and tells him at that point that he's going to be with them. Yes. And then this is where Joshua is. Yeah, there's something interesting about that how, you know, the meeting at Shechem, the Lord has given you the land. This is where God first promised the land to Abraham. Uh, Shechem was also the place where they were supposed to have the covenant renewal. Uh, it was located between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim where they were supposed to you know, come on a regular basis and recite the blessings and curses and all the other things that were going on and have the reading of the law and things like that. So you know, Shechem is important as far as a geographical center for the, the promises and the several of the covenants are you know, related directly to what happens here. And Joshua makes a covenant with the people here at Shechem. That's a good point. 
Anything else on uh, the speech that Joshua gives? There's a lot we could probably talk about, but um, one final note. Verses 29-33, It came about after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, on the north of Mount Gaash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money. And it became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, Phinehas' son, which was given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Now this is a rather... Uh, funerary ending. You know, we have Joshua dies, Joseph is buried, Eliezer dies, and um, you know, it's the, why, why does the book end with so much death? We must ask that question. Well, when you, one way, when you look at it, death is a victory for the righteous. Mm -hmm. They go on to a much better reward. Right. So here, Joseph, uh, Joshua has fulfilled his uh, uh, his purpose in life on this earth, and now he gets to enjoy the comforts of the Lord. Eliezer was another righteous man that uh, um, got to, you know, now realize the, the victory of his righteousness on this earth. And then Joseph, we see um, his bones being buried back here in Shechem, uh, in this in this area where he had asked Israel to bury him. We see the fulfillment of that. Uh, that he made. But there was something to this. I think that in many ways, whenever a, you know, a lot of books in the Bible end with the death of a major character, and it kind of leaves us longing for something more. Like, okay, the land promise has been fulfilled and everybody dies. Well, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it kind of leaves you going, well, wait, there's got to be more to the story than that. There is more to the story than that. Absolutely. And hmm? Absolutely. Yeah, there is a life beyond death. And I said the fact that you know, in the Old Testament, the idea of life after death, the idea of resurrection from the dead, it's not always explicit. Sometimes they're implying it a little bit. You know, the, the promises of God have got to go beyond this. Uh, you know, the curse of... The, the Bible story isn't over yet. The curse of Genesis 3 is still in effect and needs to be undone. Man is still returning to dust. The Lord will send somebody later, also named Joshua, who will bring back from the dead, never to die again. There's more points we could get into, but uh, that'll conclude Joshua. Hopefully this will not be the last time you study the book or look at it, and I encourage you all to uh, go through it. I enjoyed the class and the comments. Next week we'll look at Judges and uh, hopefully get into some more of that.